Thank you for attending today's Office of Disease Prevention Mind the Gap Seminar with Dr. Jill Williams. With our Medicine Mind the Gap Seminar Series, the Office of Disease Prevention hopes to bridge the gap between evidence and practice. We choose topics that explore issues at the intersection of research, evidence, and clinical practice, areas which conventional wisdom may be contradicted by recent evidence. It is our hope that the seminar series will engage the National Institutes of Health community in thought-provoking discussions to challenge what we think we know and to think critically about our role in today's research environment. We are pleased to have Dr. Jill Williams participate in our series. Dr. Williams is professor of psychiatry and director of the Division of Addiction Psychiatry at the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey, Robert Wood Johnson Medical School in New Brunswick. She also holds faculty appointments at the Cancer Institute of New Jersey and is affiliated with the UMDNJ Tobacco Dependence Program and Rutgers Center for Alcohol Studies. The focus of Dr. Williams' work has been in addressing tobacco in individuals with mental illness. Dr. Williams has developed training curricula for behavioral health professionals and manualized treatments for treating tobacco in mental health settings. Before I introduce Dr. Williams, I'd like to um, have a couple of housekeeping items. For those of you in the room, please, if you have questions, use one of the microphones because we are webcasting live and the folks on web stream cannot hear questions that are shouted from the audience. For those of you who are watching online, please feel free to submit questions using the Twitter hashtag NIHMTG or email questions to prevention at mail.nih.gov using MTG as the subject line. With that said, on behalf of the Office of Disease Prevention and our co-sponsor, the HHS Working Group on Tobacco Control and Behavioral Health, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jill Williams. Thank you for that uh, introduction. It's really wonderful to be here, and I appreciate being invited uh, to speak for you today for this very important Mind the Gap a series on this important topic. The title of my talk is Helping Smokers with Behavioral Health. Comorbidity Requires a National Effort. And these are some of the things I will discuss today. I'll review uh, trends in tobacco use. I'll discuss uh, identify the need to identify smokers with behavioral health comorbidity as a disparity group, the need for greater collaboration between behavioral health and tobacco control, and then some next steps for both behavioral health and tobacco control. This is a good place to start. This shows that smoking levels are no longer decreasing in the United States, or at least decreasing as quickly as they once did. This is a CDC morbidity and mortality report, which shows no significant change in current adult smoking from 2010 to 2011, where it stayed stable at 19%. However, it's helpful to look at longer trends, and you can see, again, reductions are minimal here between 1998 and 2006. And more importantly, we failed to meet the target of Healthy People 2010 which was a goal to reduce smoking prevalence rates in the United States to 12%. So when you look over decades, you can see that really progress has stalled, that in fact smoking rates have plateaued, and we've really failed to make uh, further declines in tobacco use despite ongoing efforts. There's been some debate about the so-called hardening hypothesis that says that the leveling in smoking prevalence seen in re recent decades is due to the fact that smokers are more resistant to quitting. This can be because of factors of increased dependence, because they have higher levels of dependence, or reduced ability to quit. Although there's controversy about whether hardening is occurring, I think there could be no doubt that there are certain groups of smokers that are not being reached by current tobacco control efforts. And these include impoverished smokers, those with low socioeconomic status, 
and smokers with behavioral health comorbidity, which includes mental illness or other addictions. It's interesting to note that uh, similar trends happened after the cocaine epidemic of the 1980s, that cocaine use has remained stable in the United States with one to two million hardcore users. And interestingly, no one is trying to treat this problem in the United States with media campaigns or merely raising the price of cocaine. Rather than look at just overall population trends, it may be important to examine what is happening in important subgroups of smokers. From this New York data, we can see that from 2000 to 2009, the smoking rate went down from 21% to about 16% for individuals with good mental health. But among those with poor mental health, as measured by the Brufus scale, which records state level health and smoking data, rates did not change during the same period. This is really an important finding and the first time that a group has been able to show with population data that smoking rates are not declining in this key population. In fact, in sharing this around the country with people, um, there's been a, a lot of groups that have mentioned that they have similar data in their uh, state or other area, and it's even brought up uh, a potential reluctance to publish or distribute this data for fear of showing that their uh, funded tobacco control efforts are not working. Different groups of tobacco users have been designated as disparity groups by CDC, and other tobacco control leadership organizations in the United States. The most common tobacco use disparity groups are included on this slide, include racial and ethnic minority groups, groups with low socioeconomic status, which can be defined by poverty, low education, or low employment. Pregnant women are also designated a tobacco use disparity group. Groups identified by sexual orientation, including lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender groups, and youth. A disparity is defined as an inequality, and health disparities are differences in health outcomes between groups that reflect social inequalities. Dr. Thomas Frieden of the CDC has said that in modern times, such disparities are unacceptable. Yet cigarette smoking, the leading cause of preventable death in the United States, is listed as one of the conditions with ongoing health disparities in the U.S. that must be addressed. I'm going to now go through the criteria that are typically used to determine if a group meets criteria to be a tobacco use disparity group. They can be defined by differences in tobacco use or rates of nicotine dependence, differences in rates of tobacco initiation or progression, differences in the ability to quit or cessation rates. They can be designated a disparity group if they suffer disproportionate health burden from tobacco, if they suffer disproportionate tobacco purchasing or economic burden from their tobacco use, if they're a victim of targeted marketing by the tobacco industry, and if they have reduced access to treatment or resources. As I go through each of these now, I'll show you the evidence that smokers with mental illness not only meet criteria for one of these characteristics, but in fact meet criteria for all of them. First, we'll look at rates of tobacco use. This now famous study published in 2000 was one of the first to show high rates of smoking in individuals with mental illness or substance use disorder using a population sample. The study found that 41% of current cigarette smokers met criteria for something listed in the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which includes all the mental health and substance use conditions. But strikingly, another 35%, although they may not be ill in the past month, met criteria for having one of these conditions in their lifetime, suggesting that only the minority of cigarette smokers in this study, 23%, did not have mental illness or substance abuse as part of their history. When the Lasser paper was published in 2000, it was met with skepticism among some tobacco control leaders. 
Now these findings have been replicated. This slide shows rates of smoking of 40 percent in individuals with mental illness compared to 21 percent in the U.S. general population. We can see very high rates among those with anxiety disorder, affective disorders, which includes depression, and the highest rates of all among those with substance use disorders. In fact, smoking rates have, have reported to be high among every known drug of abuse. So you can see among the highest smoking rates that have ever been reported among populations with other addictions. A study by Megan Piper and colleagues at Wisconsin showed that in a large sample of smokers seeking treatment to try to stop smoking that 81 percent had lifetime behavioral health comorbidity. So this is just a sample of people seeking treatment to stop smoking. 41 percent have a history of substance use disorder, 28 percent anxiety, and 13 percent depression. Again, showing the minority of cigarette smokers don't have this as part of their history. Smoking rates were also discovered to be much higher in people with serious mental illnesses like bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. But it turns out that these are poorly measured in population samples, the kinds of typical epidemiologic studies where we get information from household surveys. So the earliest reports of these findings with serious mental illness were from clinical samples, which were felt to be not as good as population data. So again, these findings were met with skepticism by some leaders. Dr. Kessler of Harvard developed a measure called the K6 that asks six questions about general levels of psychological distress. And it turns out that this is an excellent measure for estimating serious mental illness in the population. Serious mental illness refers to people who are generally disabled by their mental illness. And it reflects about 5 to 8 percent of the U.S. population. The K6 is now included in several national population surveys that also collect information about tobacco use trends, including the NHIS, BRIFIS, National Survey of Drug Use and Health, National Comorbidity Study Replication, and instruments used by the World Health Organization. We were the first to show with population data that both daily and lifetime smoking rates are increased for people with serious mental illness using data from the 2002 National Survey of Drug Use and Health. This has since been replicated by other groups. We also reported that there's a direct relationship between the severity of serious mental illness and the likelihood of being a smoker within the last month. So not only is smoking associated with the presence of mental illness, but there's a direct relationship to illness severity. Adults with depression are more likely to be current cigarette smokers. This is a study that used data from the NHANES questionnaire. And you can see smoking rates are higher for every group with depression compared to individuals without depression, where the trend is true for both genders and in all age groups. For the issue of disparity, I thought it was interesting to compare tobacco use rates among people with behavioral health comorbidity to groups that are already designated as tobacco use disparity groups. When we look at that, we see that smoking rates are in fact higher with people with mental illness, substance abuse, or serious mental illness compared to all the other groups that are designated as tobacco use disparity groups. In addition to tobacco use, we can also look at rates of nicotine dependence. Smokers with depression smoke more and are more dependent than smokers who do not have depression. The measure used here is the number of minutes in the morning until someone smokes their first cigarette, which is a highly sensitive measure for determining severity of nicotine dependence, which is also called the TTFC, or the time to first cigarette. We can see in this slide that more smokers with depression smoke in the first five minutes of wakening in the morning, and they also smoke more cigarettes per day. 
We also found that smokers with serious mental illness have higher levels of nicotine dependence, whether it's measured with the nicotine dependence syndrome scale or by using the measure of time to first cigarette in the morning. Remember that when smokers are more likely to smoke in the first five minutes of waking up in the morning, that this is an indicator of more severe levels of nicotine dependence, which really implies a difference in treatment may be necessary. Smokers with schizophrenia are among the most heavily dependent smokers, often smoking more than a pack a day and scoring high on assessments for nicotine dependence. This comes from my own research showing that smokers with schizophrenia take in more nicotine from even a single cigarette than individual control smokers who do not have major mental illness. The way people puff on cigarettes is what determines their nicotine intake and our studies, in addition to other people, have shown that individuals with schizophrenia smoke differently. It's a very intense smoking pattern with more puffs and less time between puffs. Higher levels of addiction are important because they imply a, a more difficult time in quitting. In addition to higher rates of tobacco use and nicotine dependence in smokers with behavioral health comorbidity, we also can look at factors related to smoking initiation and progression. This is important to study when we consider that all individuals in society, maybe all young people, essentially try cigarettes, and it's important to study the factors that are related to continued use, so-called smoking progression. Studies have shown, in fact, that of all the kids that try cigarettes, those with a mental illness or substance use disorder at a young age are at higher risk than other kids to go on to develop nicotine dependence or daily smoking. So studies have looked at illnesses in young people, including major depression, dysthymia, which is a chronic form of depression, generalized anxiety, substance use disorder, and two disorders of childhood, oppositional defiant disorder and conduct disorder, and shown that compared to kids without these disorders, that they are more likely to go on and develop daily smoking and nicotine dependence. Disparity groups may also be defined by differences in smoking cessation rates. So it's important to know if certain groups have reduced likelihood in quitting. It's usually measured by the number of former smokers in a population. And we can see here that smokers with serious mental illness are less likely to become former smokers and quit in their lifetime compared to people without serious mental illness. This has been known for some time and these groups may have less success in quitting on a given attempt. Newer information, however, suggests that even in milder disorders, in this study they included anxiety, depression, among other illnesses, that in fact the likelihood of becoming a former smoker was also reduced compared to people without uh, mental illness. And as an esteemed colleague from the UK, Dr. Robert West reminds us, the formula for ex-smokers includes the number of people trying to quit times the success of attempts. So a reduction in the rate of former smokers among people with mental illness may represent at least in part fewer quit attempts. This represents an area to promote in terms of future efforts. This data also shows that there's fewer former smokers among those with depression. This association is found in smokers with depression in all age groups. This study showed reduced anxiety on a given quit attempt, in, uh, I'm sorry, reduced success in quitting in smokers with anxiety disorders. And in this study, they, it included people with panic disorder, social anxiety, and generalized anxiety disorders. These disorders are quite common, and we think of them as more mild than some of the serious mental illnesses. Uh, many people have these conditions, and they work, and they have relationships and lead productive lives. And there was a thought that with the milder illnesses that it would not impact on smoking behavior and quitting. But it, again, there's a growing uh, literature that suggests that it does. So smokers with anxiety disorders had less success on a given quit attempt than the people who did not have anxiety disorders. And in fact, they also had more withdrawal symptoms. 
This is a slide courtesy of uh, a colleague, Jody Prochaska, at Stanford University. That's really a nice summary about motivation. Often there's a view or a bias that patients with behavioral health comorbidity are not motivated to address tobacco use. But this is showing across several studies that, in fact, levels of motivation to quit among these different groups of smokers is really not different than smokers in the general population. That the same rates report being ready to quit in about the next month as well as in the next six months. So it may be a myth that smokers with mental illness are not motivated to address their tobacco use. This data does not support that idea. We can next look at the health burden from tobacco use in smokers with behavioral health comorbidity. Some of you may have seen this. This has gotten a lot of attention. Recent information, this came out in 2006, shows that people with serious mental illness in the United States died 25 years before the general population. And the number one cause of death in these studies has been cardiovascular disease. We know from the classic Framingham study that cardiovascular disease is multifactorial, that several things contribute to a risk of cardiovascular disease. It could include obesity, here labeled as elevated BMI, smoking, elevated cholesterol, diabetes and hypertension. But in fact, the, the risks are cumulative when you have more than one risk factor, and smoking is still the single greatest risk factor. People look at this slide and interpret it for populations with serious mental illness, and they say, well, it must be the obesity that's driving this, that's killing patients with serious mental illness. And in fact, in this country, there has been a fair amount of effort to address obesity in seriously mentally ill populations, which is not a bad thing. But in fact, data is supporting that smoking is really driving this premature death in individuals with mental illness. In this study done by Kelly et al. with a fairly young sample, people with psychosis, age 35 to 54, the smokers died 12 times more than the non-smokers, which is a considerable amount of excess risk. Stopping smoking also has the greatest return on investment in terms of reducing cardiovascular risk. Compared with other interventions like reducing blood pressure or cholesterol or losing weight, smoking cessation produces the greatest reduction in cardiovascular risk. And helping to treat this deadly addiction is arguably the easiest intervention for behavioral health staff to implement since they are skilled at treating other addictions and they typically do not provide much general health care. This is a real case of Mr. K, a gentleman that I treated to stop smoking. Mr. K was a 50-ish year old male with a long history of schizophrenia. He had had a terrible life course in terms of his schizophrenia with a very young onset, many hospitalizations. He um, was finally at a point where he was sober after years of substance abuse. He was living with his mother, taking his psychiatric medication. And really, life was getting better for him. His illness had stabilized. And yet, he comes to me, dear Dr. Williams, my doctors told me today I have lung cancer. So our patients really do get these terrible and devastating tobacco-caused illnesses. In his lifetime, Mr. K had many encounters with the behavioral health system. And no one previously had helped him to stop smoking. A tobacco use disparity group may also be one that purchases or consumes a major portion of the tobacco market or has a significant financial burden from using tobacco. Persons with a mental disorder or substance use disorder purchase and consume 44%, nearly half of the tobacco sold in the United States. Again, this statistic has met with some skepticism. However, it's been replicated now at least twice. In Dr. Grant's study, although the rates seem like they're lower, 
uh, in the mid-30s. In fact, the definition was slightly different. She only counted people who met dsm 4 criteria for nicotine dependence, which is a subset of smokers. So this included nicotine dependence and mental illness. And in this recent um, review uh, put out in the Morbidity and Mortality Report, Again, it was a mental health estimate and didn't include substance use disorders, suggesting that this figure really is accurate in terms of the overall purchasing by the larger population. A colleague at Robert Wood Johnson Medical School, Mark Steinberg, found that smokers with schizophrenia spend a significant percentage, 27% of their monthly disability check on tobacco. This means that some groups are willing to sacrifice a lot in order to keep smoking. Again, suggesting that they may be less sensitive to increases in price. They're giving up buying basic necessities in order to maintain their tobacco addiction. Ask yourself how your quality of life would be impacted if you spend 27% of your monthly income to buy drug. A new study by Dr. Matthew Ferrelli with data from New York State found a remarkably similar result to Dr. Steinberg's study. New York has one of the highest cigarette taxes in the country at $4.35 a pack. So cigarettes are quite expensive in New York, about $10 a pack. This analysis shows that low-income smokers, those that earn less than $30,000 a year, spend 24% of their income on tobacco, which is a significant financial burden. There's also evidence that some groups, like young people and racial and ethnic minorities, have been victims of targeted marketing by the tobacco industry. But we now know that, in fact, industry documents reveal evidence also of targeting to vulnerable populations, including the mentally ill. A report published by Dr. Prochaska showed evidence of marketing to vulnerable populations. Since until recently, uh, the hospital, psychiatric hospitals actually sold cigarettes in the store, they received frequent sales promotions and giveaways from major tobacco companies. The industry also supported their efforts to block tobacco-free bans in their settings. These are also some cigarette advertisements suggesting that smoking camels is a good way to deal with high tension times or jangled nerves. Smokers commonly have the perception that smoking reduces anxiety, although research studies have actually found the opposite, that smoking is associated with more anxiety. Finally, the last criteria suggests that uh, a group may be designated a tobacco disparity group because they have reduced access to treatment, which has been shown in the behavioral health setting. Two measures that looked at this included a chart review study which showed in a psychiatric hospital less than 2% of the medical records had a designation of nicotine dependence in the patient's chart, which is very inconsistent than the idea that 60% of the population uses tobacco. So that's a large discrepancy. Similarly, an outpatient study of psychiatrist behavior showed that they were interve intervening very infrequently with less than 2% of their outpatients in terms of addressing tobacco. A survey of physician behavior showed that psychiatrists had the least awareness of the state-funded tobacco cessation services, including the quit line, than other physicians in the same state. So they can't be making referrals to these services if they're unaware that they even exist. A national survey of physician practices and attitudes with regard to smoking cessation revealed that psychiatrists were more likely than other physicians to endorse that their experience intervening with smokers was limited. They were also more likely to endorse that their staff were unfamiliar with interventions to help smokers to quit. Although, interestingly, they were less likely than other physicians to say that their time was a barrier, that, that being time limited was a barrier to providing uh, smoking cessation services, which is a good thing, suggesting that with more training and experience, we can really mobilize this workforce to intervene successfully in tobacco. 
We conduct surveys of psychiatrists and mental health professionals who attend our tobacco training in New Jersey. And although these psychiatrists endorse that they ask patients about smoking status, they're much less likely, as you can see from this slide, to offer treatments, including uh, recommending nicotine replacement therapy or other tobacco treatment medications. They're also very unlikely to refer smokers to a quit line. And only 12% felt well prepared from prior education to treat tobacco. I should say that uh, tobacco addiction is not a standard part of a curricula in terms of training uh, psychiatrists. Participants who come to our trainings also complete pre and post tests to assess their knowledge of basic concepts of tobacco withdrawal and evidence-based treatments for tobacco. You can see here in this sample of psychiatrists, baseline knowledge is quite poor. They only get about 50% correct on the pretest, which is not different than any of the other uh, non-medical specialties who take the same test. It's important that behavioral health professionals become much more adept at recognizing and treating nicotine withdrawal. The symptoms with nicotine, of nicotine withdrawal that are listed on this slide are fairly nonspecific, which means that they can overlap significantly with symptoms of depression, anxiety, and substance use disorders, making the diagnosis somewhat of a challenge. Since it's very likely that this diagnosis is being missed in behavioral health settings, these symptoms are probably occurring, but being attributed to other conditions. Also suggesting that behavioral health professionals are treating nicotine withdrawal with other medications, like antidepressants, anti-anxiety medicines, and perhaps even antipsychotic medications. Evidence of this comes from a study by Allen and all. This is really a terrific study. 40, this has nothing to do with wanting to quit smoking. 40 smokers with schizophrenia who were treated in a psychiatric emergency setting because they were having a relapse of illness were randomized to either one of two conditions. Half of the group wore a 21 milligram patch that contained nicotine, and the other half wore a patch that didn't contain any nicotine, a placebo patch. And neither the doctors nor the patients knew which group that they were assigned to. And then when the study was over, they went back and looked at the data. The results showed that the group that had received the nicotine patch in the psychiatric emergency room had shown 33% less agitation. And the, that degree of reduction in agitation is the same amount that's typically seen from an antipsychotic medication. So that's showing that nicotine withdrawal really has a profound effect on the clinical management of our patients. In terms of reduced access to treatment among the substance abuse treatment setting, a large study that looked at 550 outpatient substance abuse treatment programs in the U.S. showed that smokers with substance abuse disorders also have reduced access to cessation services. Although these sites treat all other addictions, Less than half, 41%, offer smoking cessation counseling or pharmacotherapy. Smoking in many places is still part of the behavioral health culture and the treatment setting where scheduled smoke breaks still occur. 60% of mental health consumers say that they live with smokers and they smoke indoors, which is quite troubling. More staff in these settings also use tobacco. As smoking has become more difficult in the general hospital and at the medical clinic, staff have probably shifted their jobs to treating people with mental illness and substance use disorder in order to maintain their own smoking habit. We need to reach out to smoking staff with a message of caring and treatment to improve their health and productivity and to reduce their re resistance to tobacco-free initiatives in these settings. This is a good place to pause. In behavioral health, we really need to clean up our image. Even recent depictions of psychiatrists and patients in psychiatric hospitals continues to show smoking.
So as we've seen from this first part of my talk, smokers with behavioral health comorbidity meet all of these criteria for being a tobacco use disparity group. Yet if you visit the websites and read the literature of the major tobacco control groups in the United States, you'll find them missing. You may be asking why is it important to designate this group as a disparity group? Well, doing so can greatly increase access to scientific funding and treatment resources. In fact, if we don't acknowledge the problem, it will only worsen over time. One could, in fact, argue that the thrust of all tobacco control efforts from this point forward be directed away from general population measures and towards the two most important tobacco use disparity groups, smokers with low socioeconomic status and smokers with behavioral health comorbidity. We know from disparities literature that progress in this area demands a paradigm shift and represents a major change in the status quo. Universally available programs in the general population will not be enough. Special programs targeted to the needs of this disparity group are essential. I've been using this term tobacco control. Tobacco control refers to the coordinated efforts to reduce tobacco related diseases and death through eliminating exposure to secondhand smoke, promoting quitting, and preventing initiation among youth. A comprehensive approach in tobacco control at the state or county level combines educational, clinical, regulatory, economic, and social strategies that include things like clean indoor air policy, increasing the price of tobacco or raising taxes, and social and media messages that promote smoking cessation and show the realities of tobacco addiction. For the most part, the strategies listed on this slide have not been applied to smokers with behavioral health comorbidity. So we just don't know if these strategies are effective for this population. And a good, this is actually a good place to start in terms of generating a research agenda. And in terms of next steps, there is a question in the field as to which approach to take. Do we implement current evidence-based practices for tobacco using the public health model, which is usually implemented in the primary health care setting, using brief interventions that rely on limited insurance coverage? An example of this would be telephone counseling, the so-called quit lines that are available in every state. Or do we need to take a different approach, using the clinical or co-occurring treatment model that allows us to treat mental illness and addiction simultaneously in the behavioral health setting, relying more on longer treatments and face-to-face -face counseling? These treatments cannot occur without expanded Medicaid and Medicare coverage for smoking cessation, which to date has been minimal to non-existent and can vary greatly from state to state. In addition, there are concerns that the usual community or state-funded treatments for, um, often offered by tobacco control may not work for smokers with behavioral health comorbidity. Typically, these smokers are available targeting the highly motivated smoker ready to try to quit. Smokers with behavioral health comorbidity may not be aware of these services, and so they're not accessing them, or they may have trouble accessing them due to transportation or other challenges. Sometimes these treatments have very brief or rigid algorithms for how treatment is delivered, and in addition, stigma may make it difficult. For example, I visited states where the entire quitline telephone counseling protocol to stop smoking is four calls. State or county tobacco control programs are typically housed in the health department. And in addition to state funding, receive limited federal support. Historically, mental health services developed separately from the general medical systems and are now housed in the Department of Human Services, which may be completely separated and without links to the Department of Health.
So you can see here that the Department of Health is usually where the Office of Tobacco Control may be uh, located. They take a public health model, and this office may also be involved in some of the licensing of hospitals and medical health facilities. Just to show that the, the silos, the way the services have developed over time, has created organizational barriers that have made um, uh, uh, cooperation across these agencies difficult. The Department of Human Services over here typically has services for people with mental health conditions, addictions. It also may house children and family services, uh, the Office of Developmental Disabilities. Interestingly, it also includes the Office of Medical Assistance, typically in welfare, showing that there would be links as well to populations of low-income smokers by partnering with Departments of Human Services. And these um, offices are involved in the licensing of behavioral health. Uh, facilities. So there's many benefits of linking these two departments at the level of state or county government. And we really need to do this in order to tackle the problem of smoking among people with mental illnesses. Offices of tobacco control have been highly effective in health communication, coalition building, and developing tobacco regulations. These are really their strengths, among others, whereas the Office of Behavioral Health and Human Services has access to a large clinical workforce. They have uh, relationships with insurers, including Medicaid, that are quite close. Uh, and they're also close to the target population. So you can see here, there would be great benefits to linking, although in very few states is this occurring. I'm a great proponent of this, that behavioral health really needs to take a lead in treating tobacco. There's many reasons why this makes sense. Obviously, there's tremendous uh, patient need among our populations. Nicotine dependence is one of the disorders that I'm always reminding psychiatrists is listed in the DSM. So it's part of our diagnostic and statistical manual of conditions that we treat. Staff in behavioral health settings are often highly experienced and trained in the treatment of other addictions. Uh, we often typically see patients for longer and more treatment sessions. We're experts in counseling. There's links to symptoms. There's so many reasons that this makes sense. In terms of working with a behavioral health uh, group to encourage them to treat tobacco, I try and remind them that um, one of the reasons for addressing smoking is that it's contrary to the goals of wellness, recovery, and community integration that they're working so hard on. Two places where smokers experience stigma is in trying to obtain jobs and housing, as employers and landlords would much rather deal with non-smokers. Non-smoking employees have greater daily and annual productivity rates and cost less for insurance than their smoking counterparts. By recognizing that the consequences of tobacco use are beyond the medical ones, staff can align addressing tobacco with other recovery goals to motivate clients to seek treatment. This is the model of mental health tobacco recovery that we've developed in New Jersey. Starting over here, it's important that we engage smokers in treatment and that we provide clinical treatment in the behavioral health setting. We need to engage and motivate smokers to seek treatment. We may do that through uh, some wellness curricula or other activities geared to wellness that are occurring in the behavioral health site. And then we need to actually provide cessation treatment to help these smokers to quit. But that is not enough. We also need to deal with the environment. We need to develop uh, policies that support tobacco-free environments because we know when it's more difficult to smoke that more people will be motivated to try to quit and that this will also support the quitting efforts of some people. In addition, we need to train staff who largely have not benefited from training in how to treat tobacco dependence. Again, that's also not enough. We also need to have strong links to the community. We've done this through peer programs advocacy with our local mental health advocacy groups, and ensuring that people in our state have access to the tobacco treatment medications, largely through the Medicaid formulary. So um, 
You can see here we've actually developed small pilot initiatives over the years that target each of these things. So one of them is the Choices Program, which is actually peer-to-peer -peer outreach. Um, we pay mental health consumers and train them to speak about tobacco and to uh, meet with audiences of consumers in behavioral health settings to spread the message that they should be uh, seeking treatment for their tobacco addiction. We've worked with the state of New Jersey on policies. We uh, now have completely tobacco-free state psychiatric hospitals in New Jersey. We've developed trainings for mental health staff targeting psychiatrists and behavioral health professionals in evidence-based treatments. We've developed curricula for working with low motivated smokers, that's the learning about healthy living manual that some of you may be uh, familiar with. We've worked with the Medicaid formulary, which is an ongoing battle, and we work with Mental Health America in our state and the New Jersey Division of Mental Health and Addiction Services uh, because we need important and ongoing links to community and local resources. And it's only when we have all of these things working together that we really think we can have the greatest impact in terms of increasing demand for tobacco treatment services and helping smokers to quit. So I hope someday I turn on my television at night and there's a public health service announcement that says that three-fourths of smokers have a past or present problem with addiction or mental illness. But it hasn't happened yet. The good news, though, is that there has been progress. I'm encouraged by recent advances in this area. Notably, the CDC did several reports, including a morbidity and mortality report in February of this year. This is the first public acknowledgment by the CDC of the problem of smoking and mental illness. The data in this report confirm the studies that were presented today. In addition to the CDC's work, I'd also like to acknowledge the HHS Working Group on Tobacco Control and Behavioral Health, which is chaired by Doug Tipperman and is also really leading the charge in this area in terms of federal agency coordination. Other signs of progress in this area this is another good example. This is published by NASHBID, the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors. They've taken an interest in this issue as an organization, and they've been very successful in raising awareness. As a result of their work, you can see that the percentage of state psychiatric hospitals with no smoking on the premises had in has increased from 40 to almost 80 percent since they started their survey in 2006. However, more needs to be done, as you can see that the tobacco treatment rates in these sites still remains too low. Other signs of hope, the Montana Tobacco Use Prevention Program has done some outstanding posters, which are examples of counter-advertising, media messages, counter-advertising are media messages designed to counter the destructive effects of tobacco industry advertising. Until recently, there were no examples of counter-advertising targeting populations with behavioral health comorbidity. This one is my favorite. I didn't survive depression and suicide attempts only to die from lung cancer. I had to stop smoking. There are also now many free toolkits that are available on the internet. These discuss smoking and mental illness and ways to develop clinical and systems interventions, so there are resources out there for people who want to do this work. The Smoking Cessation Leadership Center has probably done the most in terms of bringing attention to smokers with behavioral health comorbidity. The Legacy Foundation also produced a, book, a booklet on successful pilot programs for addressing tobacco that includes our continuing ed training for psychiatrists and the Choices peer-to-peer -peer program. So I like to say this is not a leadership problem. I mean, this is not a money problem. This is a leadership problem because, in fact, we spend a lot of money on tobacco. Unfortunately, it's spent in all the wrong areas. Tobacco-related health costs still in the U.S. cost $96 billion. There's an additional $97 billion B, in uh, tobacco-related costs in losses of productivity. 
26 billion is the amount generated, the amount of money that comes into states every year that's generated from cigarette taxes and master settlement agreement payments. The cost to Medicaid from tobacco caused illnesses are also $22 billion, which represents 11% of the total Medicaid budget. Tobacco industry spends $10 billion on cigarette advertising, of which $7 billion includes uh, low cost, discounted tobacco, and promotions, give away tobacco, hook people. The smallest number on the slide, $518 million, is how much the states actually spend on tobacco control efforts, which is less than 2% of this number, the $26 billion generated by cigarette taxes and master settlement payments. So there is money, but I would argue that without leadership, it's not being spent in the right column. The other thing to keep in mind is that state tobacco control programs are grossly underfunded as compared to expert recommendations. The scarcity of resources has increased pressure to demonstrate ongoing effectiveness of these tobacco control programs, something that may prove difficult in the future if these trends continue. So this is the fun part where I get to talk about recommendations and next steps. In terms of tackling any problem, I think it's always important to first acknowledge the problem and raise awareness. Once that's done, we need to create and implement targeted interventions, dedicate resources and effort to the problem. And then finally, we need to evaluate, sustain, and revise our initiatives with feedback. I think we've done a great job so far at number one. I think we've acknowledged the, the problem and we've raised awareness, and it's time now to really focus on the second step, something to date which I think we've not really done. Virtually no state tobacco control resources are directed towards this population. So although we've made some progress, there's a lot more that needs to be done, and again, it's going to take hard work and money. It's not just going to happen because we want it to happen. But when one in three smokers has a mental illness, shouldn't they get one out of three dollars? Or if three out of every ten cigarettes are smoked by people with a mental illness, shouldn't they get three out of every ten dollars directed to tobacco control? Obviously, I'm being somewhat facetious, but the allocation of resources has not been that way. So I think we need to really prioritize this group as a disparity group for both research and services funding. I think we need comprehensive policy and treatment in the behavioral health setting. I think we need efforts to train behavioral health professionals so they can do this work. And we need to ensure access to pharmacotherapy and adequate Medicaid coverage for treatment at the level of the states. So thank you for your attention. I will conclude and be happy to take some questions. So thank you, Jill. That was really an enlightening and comprehensive talk. Um, one of the themes that kept coming up was um, this idea that this population has reduced access to evidence-based treatments that we already know work. But they also um, are smoke differently, you mentioned. They may have special treatment needs. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about you know, how we direct resources, um, whether it's disseminating our evidence-based treatments that, that we, you know, already have. Is it developing new treatments, a combination of those two? Um, that's a great question. I think, although I set a lot of these arguments up today for the presentation in terms of this or that, the correct answer is probably going to be both. 
that we're going to need for today to help the smokers of today with the information that we have today using current evidence-based treatments. And remember that um, although I've spoken mostly about the behavioral health setting uh, today in my talk, that in fact many people with behavioral health conditions seek their treatment in primary care. So it's, you, you know, we want to have no wrong door is really the best way to access treatment, that people could get it through primary care, but that increasingly they could also seek it in the behavioral health setting, which I think can also offer a more specialized and perhaps more intensive treatment service for anyone who's not able to quit with just a primary care or brief intervention. So I think we need to do both. I think we need to find out why there's fewer former smokers in this population and study that question. Is it that people are making fewer quit attempts in their lifetime, or is it that they're less successful on a given attempt? I mean, we have some research, but not enough to really understand that. And we're just beginning to do studies that show what kinds of treatments will be effective. So I think we're going to really need a comprehensive strategy. Kind of fun. It's like Oprah. Can you hear me? I'm Marion Scheinholz. I'm from SAMHSA, so we've had email conversation. Um, and um, this is Tenley Pa and um, Hannah, who's here from our training center. And we, just to tell the group, we represent um, an, a grant program where we're trying to integrate primary care with behavioral health care. And we have 93 sites right now. And um, we are really struggling with tobacco cessation. Um, our programs, in fact, we have some that are finishing, and um, one that I'm working with, particularly after four years in Kentucky, is still really struggling, and I'm sure you can imagine some of the issues there. And so I guess my question, my first question for you is, um, or, or my overall question is just, how can we help our grantees to um, be more successful with, you know, we, we do have this integration going on, but how can we help them to be more successful with the people with serious mental illness who they're working with to, to try to quit, to be successful at quitting, et cetera? It's sort of a, 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 a connected to the question that was just asked. How, how can we help these people? We have lots of technical assistance. Well, we have a lot of, we have a fair amount of technical assistance money, and we have very interested project officers. Um, thank you for that great question. I'm glad uh, that you're here and that there's so many representatives from SAMHSA uh, and other uh, government agencies here today. I mean, hopefully you've heard something in the talk that you know, we need to provide treatment, we need to train staff, uh, but we, we, sometimes we need to do more, that the model showed that we really need to kind of have the whole system engaged in the initiative, that if just one piece is there, if you have just a small subset of staff providing tobacco treatment, they may feel it, it's very difficult to sustain uh, because there are so many forces in the other direction. And so I think when you have policy and leadership supporting treatment, you'll find that your efforts are much more successful. And I think that that requires training and buy-in. We, we call these buy-in trainings, not just clinical trainings about how to do the treatment, but the buy-in to really underscore the rationale and need to do this, to raise this as a disparity issue. Um, so that people become more dedicated to it. Unfortunately, tobacco is one of the lowest priorities in behavioral health right now, something that needs to change. And remember, um, we've had a lot of missed opportunities here when you look back. I mean, there continue to be program announcements from various funding sources and federal agencies that will fund substance abuse conditions that exclude tobacco. So I think there's a lot we can do in terms of even thinking of how we can change that so that tobacco is a co-occurring disorder and that we, we stop excluding it from other initiatives. Um, one of your slides said that 22% of psychiatrists believe that cessation heightens uh, other symptoms. And you also mentioned that a lot of people with anxiety believe that cigarette smoking actually lowers their anxiety. Um, how do you deal with uh, these attitudes towards um, smoking and smoking cessation related to behavioral health symptoms? So my, uh, my work is mostly in schizophrenia. And in fact, there's been um, 
probably 12 or 15 studies uh, looking at people with schizophrenia trying to quit smoking that do not show that the illness worsens when people try to quit smoking uh, or take various uh, tobacco treatment medications. So we need to continue to do the research to demonstrate to people that there's not evidence of worsening, uh, real worsening. But I agree it's a barrier. It's a barrier for a lot of patients who fear that their illness will return. And so it feels overwhelming for them to try to quit smoking because they feel that that's so risky. And then I also think that it's complicated by nicotine withdrawal. Because if we don't really treat nicotine withdrawal aggressively in these highly addicted smokers, then it's very likely they're going to experience restlessness and anxiety, trouble concentrating. And even if that's not their illness recurring per se, they're going to think that it is. They're going to be uncomfortable. They're going to suffer. Uh, and they're not going to succeed in quitting. So we need to take an approach that also really aggressively treats them for their nicotine withdrawal. So this question came in through our prevention mailbox. Um, the question was, what difference, if any, are there between adolescent and adult smokers with mental illness with respect to smoking rates and prevention strategies? This particular person has a 17-year-old daughter with symptoms of borderline personality disorder and likely addition issues who finds smoking to be calming, a calming strategy for dealing with emotion deregulation. So there have not been very many studies uh, looking at smoking in all the different diagnostic groups. So personality disorders, for example, have not been really well studied in terms of smoking behavior and smoking cessation. So the question about if youth is different than adults, I mean, it's an area where we have so little research, it's really hard to say. On the other hand, if someone's trying to quit smoking on their own, any smoker, and they're addicted, they're going to have withdrawal. And so they're going to have those feelings of agitation and anxiety that can emerge after only hours after your last cigarette. And so somebody who's prone to emotional dysregulation um, may be more sensitive to that. And so. Uh, again, re recognize that smokers are kind of going through that all the time, and then people will attribute that smoking helps them when really all they're doing is use, using their drug to take them out of withdrawal. So smoking doesn't really provide a true benefit. It's just that people feel better when they're no longer in their drug withdrawal by smoking a cigarette, essentially. So it's a trap for people. Um, and it's really the reason that instead of just saying to patients, you need to quit, the message needs to be, you need to quit with treatment so that you can be comfortable and more likely to succeed. Hi. Um, you mentioned Choices in New Jersey as one of the peer programs that um, is implemented in the state and that it's pretty successful. Are there other types of peer-to-peer programs in terms of to, um, tobacco cessation groups, smoking uh, wellness groups and stuff like that. Because I think we struggle with, you know, they can implement by through their clinician or through their therapist or through someone not like the, the nurse care manager who's running these groups, um, which is helpful, I think, especially if you are in the SMI population and you have chronic physical conditions like high blood pressure, high BMI, et cetera. Um, but I'm wondering on the other flip side in terms of the peer piece, how successful that is and if that can be also from one of my grantees, we've had people say, you know, we worry about the person leading the group. Even though it attracts other consumers, it also ha can heighten them at risk for being, you know, susceptible to um, wanting to smoke again or mm -hmm. being triggered. Um, so let me just say that in the Choices Program, our counselors are, um, they're not actually providing cessation services. Their goal is really to interact with smokers on an educational and motivational level with the idea that those, they can help people to link or re be referred to treatment services. There are other places, I think, that are also investigating the role of peer counselors as uh, group leaders, uh, providing some support, or even cessation treatment. Uh, but our model has not done that. We see it more as a linking function. But I think that there's many ways that we can mobilize peers to be helpful. Uh, we found that in terms of engaging an audience of smokers, there's really nothing more powerful than a peer standing up and saying, you know, I saved $47,000 uh, on, on cigarettes just in the last four years from quitting and how that, you know, can have a huge impact uh, on the audience and be motivating. 
So I hope that there is development and support for future uh, peer initiatives. Hi, thank you so much for a great presentation. So when someone enters an inpatient behavioral health or mental health facility, they are required to leave all their substances at the door, often going cold turkey. Um, yet they are allowed often to bring their cigarettes with them, and as you mentioned, they get cigarette smoking breaks. So how much attention is being given to this to encourage facilities to address tobacco addiction? So the answer is not enough. Um, I think that at this point uh, we have a spectrum in terms of mostly state hospitals being the most restrictive and the private hospitals uh, continuing to support, enable smoking uh, because of concern that patients will not come and that it will affect the bottom line. For that reason, it's useful when these policies get implemented because they can level the playing field and make everybody have to adhere to the same kinds of rules. So I don't think that we're doing enough in hospitals, but when we look at the spectrum of all the behavioral health services, in some ways we've done the most in hospital settings. Sometimes it's the easiest, it's the most controlled environment, um, but certainly we need to do more. And, and it is concerning to me when um, when you see kind of list of things to bring to treatment and it includes tobacco on the list. Um, hopefully that's the old way of thinking and doesn't reflect some of the newer advances. Is there any recent information about smoking patterns and prevention in prison populations? Of course, many of these individuals would be included in the groups discussed in your talk, but management would probably have to be a bit different. Again, uh, it's not my area of expertise, but there is beginning to be uh, movement on uh, uh, prisons becoming smoke-free. Um, so I, would, I think we have a range uh, of, of policies across the United States where some are highly restrictive and some still allow smoking. I agree, unfortunately, a lot of people with mental illness these days end up in prison settings, especially as hospitals are closing. Um, uh, but I think it's really kind of the same. We, we could extrapolate that the trends that we see for state hospital are probably true as well, that you know, putting a policy in place and having enforcement, that's what these sites do. They're probably pretty good at that. That can be an easy goal to achieve in this setting. The more difficult one is actually offering people treatment, not punishing people because they have addiction, uh, making sure people have uh, access to safe and comfortable detox from substances. And that's the piece that I think is probably not happening in most prison settings still. Um, on behalf of the Office of Disease Prevention and the HHS Working Group on Tobacco Control and Behavioral Health, I'd like to thank Dr. Williams from coming out, for coming out today and remind you that on May 9th, we have another Mind the Gap seminar, Designing and Analyzing Randomized Controlled Trials in the Prevention of Mental Disorders and Drug Abuse with Dr. Hendricks-Brown. Thank you very much. <laughs>